You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now. It's time for the show that breaks down the options market. From unusual activity alerts to market updates and trading strategies. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block. With your host, Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com and co-hosts. Uncle Mike Tussaw from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionFit.com. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Option Block, everyone's favorite bi-weekly source for all things options related. A little bit of wit, a little bit of wisdom. A little bit of analysis, a little bit of unusual activity, a dollop, a spice of education, throw in some listener mail, you stir it all up, and you have the delicious cocktail that is the option block. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting Options Insider Radio Network. A plethora of content available for you on the website and, indeed, on the network. I guess the site's probably the best place to go to get everything, all the written stuff as well as all the radio. You can stream it all or download it all right from the site or, of course, also iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, etc. A few of you written in saying you grabbed the mobile app for the Fire OS, so good to hear Amazon getting some uh, some fire love out there as well. So all of our versions are, are getting some love on the mobile app side. If you guys want to send us questions, comments, interact with us via the app, it's really easy to do. It's mostly baked in there as well. I know a few of you have asked also about notifications on the Android side. We have to make a few tweaks uh, to make that happen for you. Should be coming soon. But on the iOS side, the push notifications already enabled. So if you have the iOS app on your iPhone or iPad or whatever you're rocking, make sure you enable those notifications. So you'll learn whenever a new episode is coming your way. I'll give you a hint. They're coming away quite a bit. So stay tuned for those. And also stay tuned for my fellow compatriots here on the old all-star panel. Starting off, let's go in order of proximity to this, the options capital of the world, sunny Chicago. We go out into the hinterlands of Chicago, stop by a little sleepy hamlet known as St. Charles, Illinois, to welcome on none other than Uncle Mike Tussaud from RCM Wealth Advisors. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the Option Block program. Sir, it has been far too long since I believe Monday. Oh, my goodness. It just takes forever between shows. I wish we could just do the show constantly 24-7. I know you like me. You're just sitting there watching the clock, every tick saying, when is the next Option Block? When is it? I cannot wait. I got your email last night. It literally kept me up at night. I'm so excited about answering that question. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll get to that in a little bit. Before we do that, let's also welcome on my other compatriot from a little bit farther afield. It's really not the options capital of the world. It might be the lobster capital of the world. So we'd like to welcome on the rock lobster himself, Mr. Andrew Giovinazzi, from a few things on the old network. Also, Moonlight as a mentee slash risk manager over there at Option Pit and a few other areas. He's got a lot of hats he wears over there in the land of the pit. Mr. Rock Lobster, welcome back to the program, sir. It is a pleasure. Now, a question about the spice comment earlier. Would would Tusa be sporty spice? <laughs> and you would be posh spice since you live in some tower in the middle of Chicago. Would that how would that work? I wasn't thinking of spice girls. I was thinking more of spice flavorings. But yeah, if you want to go that way, I guess Tusa would be sporty. I could be scary. That'd be kind of fun. Uh, then I could. Scare <laughs> I thought people. I was grumpy or sneezy. I don't, is, I don't know if there are. I don't grumpy. think that's a spice girl. <laughs> I think that's a a dwarf. I'm a nah, bit, I get those. I get those mixed up pretty easily. I'm not as up on my Spice Girls. I mean, maybe if you had asked me like 15 years ago, perhaps. <laughs> but uh, not, not perhaps too much. I think I think Andrew is definitely posh, though. I think that makes a lot of sense. You know, I could see you with the urban city living, fancy dresses. Sounds like you. Uh, so <laughs> there we go. All right, now that you write in, listeners, let us know 
who your favorite Spice Girl is, A, and B, which one of us fits that category? I'm curious and or terrified to hear your suggestions. But without further ado, let's keep on rolling. Get away from that Spice Girl madness and get on into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Trading Block. If you guys haven't figured it out by now, and of course, all you new listeners piling all the time, so welcome A, B. This is the portion of the show where we break down what's moving, what's shaking, what's rocking, what's rolling on the old street today. We are recording this on Thursday, November. I almost said October. My mind isn't in November yet. <laughs> November 5th for all of you playing along with the home game. And it was another day of a little bit of indecision on the old street. We've seen a lot of uh, very strident moves on the street in recent weeks. Some strident moves to the upside. Very clear moves to the downside and vice versa. Today was... A little bit more on the on the wishy washy range. Uh, the S and P closing almost literally unched on the day after having been down about ten handles intraday and then rallying to kind of close pretty much unched. Most of the other major indices following suit. We're also seeing, uh, despite this relative vacillation in the indices today, we're seeing people uh, exhaling a bit on the old implied vol side. VIX cash coming off about four tenths of a point, uh, hovering around a little bit north of the 15 handle. I won't dare to invoke a percent of a percent, Mr. Rock Lobster, but I will say it's a sizable percent of a percent out there. Maybe we'll start there, actually. Does that kind of surprise you? We do indeed have non-farms tomorrow, not to uh, not to preface the around-the-block segment too much, but we have non-farms. It's been kind of a bit of an issue of late. What level of premium is that going to inject back into the markets? We still are in the teeth of earnings season. Friday, not a big day for earnings, but we still are in the middle of that. The fact that we'd see a little bit of a of an exhale going into an event like non-farms, does that surprise you at all? They've been bidding the vol kind of all week. Uh, so we saw the market kind of rallied early in the week with the vol staying bid. And today, excuse me, the market actually sold off and vol sold off. So, you know, not a lot, but a little. But that's substantial because uh, I think a lot of the um, curve, uh, some of the curve on the downside sort of came out there. I think everybody's just tired of the Fed. Just shut up and do something. You know, the market gets a little fatigue. You're trading it. We got VIX is around 15 and a half, almost 16. And we're moving at about, you know, two tenths of a percent a day. So vol is definitely waiting for something to happen. And, you know, is something really going to happen? I guess that's the big question for all of us. So it feels like if it's not December, it's January. And they just get on with it so we can get over whatever this issue is with them but the reality is is all of these non-farm payroll numbers any kind of number that's you know the market's been riding a kind of a wave of fed low interest rate easy money policies market loves it the algos love it and the market flies whenever it hears anything like that so you know you get some sort of ho-hum number out of the non-farm payrolls tomorrow, we could do another row up, oh, you know, so ho, ho, ho hum news is good news. And we're up another 1%. So I'm just looking at how volatility is pricing. We just kind of covered it in our lab today. Like that near term vol is uh, 20% for tomorrow. Kind of hard to price one day volatility, but uh, November Thanksgiving volatility is 11 and a half. It's just, there's a huge, <laughs> Whatever's going to happen tomorrow is the big event, and then we don't expect anything to happen for three straight weeks. That's how it's pricing it. Um, usually, that's a little more bullish than not uh, because just nobody wants to buy any kind of protection, any kind of juice out there. That's what we got. I'm looking here at the at the futures chain for the VIX while we're while we're talking here, and you're right. They to use a technical term, they smoked it <laughs> across the board today. Uh, really, really shellacked the front end of the curve. Kind of getting to what you're saying earlier. They maybe had priced in, overpriced in a little bit of that premium going into the rest of the week, and now uh, taking it out ever so aggressively, particularly on the near end of the curve, a little bit less as you go farther out, obviously, but still uh, shellacking pretty much across the board. Interesting going into the teeth of tomorrow. Uh, that they're that they're not reluctant to do that again, indicating that perhaps they were a bit overzealous in their bids earlier in the week. Oh, what a fickle bunch vol traders are. Before we get into the rest of what's happening, we'll now turn our gaze a little bit closer to home, back to good old St. Charles, a sleepy hamlet, yet an options mecca unto itself. 
because of one man, Uncle Mike Tusa, Uncle Mike, what caught your eye in today's activity, sir? Just the movement in general, because if you look at the market, uh, we we open up a little bit higher, and then we have a big sell-off going into the end of the first hour, and then we just kind of channel the rest of the day. So main thing that caught my eye was the big sell-off in the early morning. Uh, a couple other things of note <clears throat> is that there really wasn't anything of major note uh, that didn't really stand out by comparison to the market. Uh, but for today's action, I think the main thing is just the big sell-off that we had right after hour one. And I, I think that just, I'm with Andrew. I think the big event that's coming up is tomorrow morning uh, with non-farm. So uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, along with uh, earnings. I know Facebook uh, came up a bunch after earnings and there's some basic earnings announcements that uh, were uh, good and bad, so to speak, like always. But for the most part, the focus is on non-farm in about 17 hours. And our focus here, of course, shifts to what's cooking right now, cooking off in the old after hours. And we've got some names reporting after the bell today. Listeners, probably most notably amongst them being Disney. Of course, ticker symbol DIS. They closed at about 113 even. Uh, they were pricing into that at the money straddle nearly five bucks, so a little bit over four percent. Uh, they were pricing in to that after hours move here and the earnings move so far. Looks like the number is out, looks like they're up about 85 cents or so. So, if that is indeed the extent of the move, and we know in the initial, the initial shakeouts, it never is. Uh, that will be a huge underperformance from a straddle vol perspective. It has been a weird kind of the story of Disney of late has kind of been an interesting one to watch. If you've been paying attention to them at all, listeners, they kind of really got their legs cut out from underneath them back in the August time frame uh, when a lot of news coming out about people, the cable cutters uh, starting to drop ESPN and then the rates that mean ESPN's long been known as a very big cash cow for them. And they may not be able to charge those premium rates anymore or have to unbundle it, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that, of course, a modest decline in ESPN numbers for the first time really spooked a lot of analysts. So they really slammed the stock. It got down to, I believe, into the 90s. It might have even in that day of madness back on August 24th may have even dipped. Uh, that doesn't really count, but that, that hit about a low of 90 on uh, August 24th before bouncing back to about, uh, oh, about 95 level or so. But it vacillated around that range. And ever since then, it seems like that that was a really relatively aberrant blip because the market's been pushing it back up ever since then, right up pretty much almost on to where it closed right before earnings back in the August time frame. So apparently... Whatever storm was brewing over ESPN, apparently that has abated. I don't know. I don't know what has changed in the last few months. Uh, results coming out of their parks and other things being somewhat strong. So maybe that's starting to to uh, improve the sentiment. Also, a lot of people starting to look towards Star Wars. But again, that's not a surprise. That's been on the horizon for quite some time. So why they would slam it in August and then love it a couple months later, kind of an odd thing. But that's the, the market nonetheless. Uh, Mr. Rock Lobster, you guys pay attention at all to the big Diz over there in the chat room today? Uh, not in, you know what? It just didn't make our radar screen for some, for whatever reason. It just, it didn't make our radar screen. We didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are, you hold your nose up at names like Disney. You got You love your Teslas and your, and your Facebooks and your, and your, S, your I almost said something else <laughs> and your, uh, and your XLEs and whatnot out there rather than good old Disney. Uh, I think Disney is going to be interesting when they start to monetize the new Star Wars stuff. Well, they're already doing that. You know, you have a little boy under the age of 10 or so. They've been uh, lining up for Star Wars toys for the last couple of months. Probably that BB-8 one, the $150 Robodrone being the most popular of them out there. So if that's any, indi any indication, just the number of toys they've been selling, uh, this stock should be uh, off to the races. And who knows, maybe we'll be here in the after hours. Uncle Mike, you also talked about Facebook. They had a, an interesting run earlier this week. They, of course, reported earlier this week, and they rally home mode. As a result out there, and then rallying again today up uh, oh, about nearly five handles or so uh, coming off on the heels of, the, of course, the earnings announcement, uh, nearly 5% total here on the day, doing nearly a million contracts, 900,000 and change today out there in Facebook. That is a serious amount of paper for them. They've been averaging nearly 300,000 and doing 3x on that uh, today. So just lighting it up, not surprisingly, about two and a half to one calls over puts out there. So lighten it up from an overall volume and an upside perspective. Apparently, all the drum beats of the death knell of Facebook when it comes to mobile ad revenue not being as high as online, et cetera, et cetera. Didn't really matter. 
Friday, March, they reported an 11% increase in third quarter earnings as, again, more advertisers turning towards Facebook as their platform of choice. So apparently, again, all the death knells being sounded for them were a little bit premature. Where the death knell perhaps was not premature came in uh, overall volume land for the options business. It's that time of month where early in the month, the volume numbers are coming out. We didn't get a chance to get to my Monday show. And uh, this October, surprise, surprise, not perhaps uh, the best month, certainly when compared to uh, last year's volume. Remember last year, it was a definite rocktober in October of 2014. Uh, we try not to use that term too much anymore this year due to listener requests. Uh, many, many listener requests. But uh, still a lot of interesting stuff going on, but not so much from a volume perspective. Uh, OCC numbers came out earlier this week. 20%, 26%, excuse me, decrease in overall volume in October of 2015 compared to October of 2014. Uh, the volume is about 367 million contracts versus nearly 500 million last year at this time. Overall ADV down 3% year-to-date in 2015 with about 16.8 million uh, contracts here. That's ADV now. And, of course, uh, exchange-listed options, that's where a lot of you are interested. Of course, 26% decrease from last year. Uh, year Year-to-date ADV also down about 3%. Equity options numbers are about similar. Index options taking probably the biggest hit off about 30% in October to about 38 million contracts. So, October, not the rockingest of months from an overall volume perspective out there this past month. We'll see if November can sneak in to perhaps change the course. We were talking on our Vol Views program last week with, with Russell over there from the CBO about how he's done some research in November, a surprisingly volatile month and a heavy volume month, more than more than you might surprise or you might guess, given the uh, most people don't think of November on the top of their lists in terms of active months, but looking at the data, it actually is. So perhaps November can uh, contribute to that. And since we're talking volume and industry stuff, really quick takeaway. This week, listeners here in Chicago was the big Futures Industry Association Expo. That's, of course, where pretty much the entire derivatives industry on the listed side, futures and, of course, options gathers here in Chicago to discuss all sorts of interesting topics uh, when it comes to uh, the options biz. They talk a lot about volume, talk a lot about regulation, as you might imagine, some interesting nuggets coming out of that that I thought were worthy of note. Uh, for example, there was a, a panel this morning about, about regulatory impact on the option space, and they were saying they did some analysis of the top series going up and the top volume names going up in the equity options world, and they found that the average duration for a U.S. option traded here in the States, of course, is 30 days now. So pretty much exactly at that monthly window, uh, which is down from what it was in previous years, a lot of that being due to the fact that, of course, a lot of the liquidity, a lot of the interest, a lot of the volume migrating into those weeklies. So those weeklies bringing down uh, the average duration pretty much across the board. Also, a lot of talk about regulation, and I know we don't get into that a lot on this show because a lot of it is pretty deep in the weeds, but it can impact you guys a lot here in a lot of different ways, and a lot of talk these days about some proposed regulation for things like leverage ratios and your capital requirements for trades, and a lot of people kept banding about this uh, this example, and uh, Andrew, I'm sure you'll find this pretty shocking, and, and Mike, you as well. Uh, we heard this a lot today, that if you go out there right now, the way the proposals are right now for some of these capital reserve requirements, and you just do a simple $25 vertical out there in SPX, let's say you do a $25 call vertical, you know, you and I know your inherent most that spread can be worth is 25 bucks. The you know, most you can lose is whatever you paid for it. If you're short at the max, it can be 25 bucks. So you think your capital reserve requirements would be somewhere around that $25 range, uh, depending on what you have on, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but they're saying now because of the way these new requirements are written and the fact that they don't take into account things like Delta and other things like that, uh, the requirements are anywhere from 3x to about 12x what you actually should have on the table for a, even a simple $25 risk limited vertical like that, which is stunning. And that shows probably why a lot of market making firms are getting the heck out of the business, A, and B, if they are still trading, they're trading again in that more front month weekly stuff because the capital requirements there are a little bit more straightforward and they can't really change that much in a week or two. So you kind of know what you're putting on. And again, also the notion that they don't adjust for Delta and some of these new requirements. So if you're short far out of the money, far in the money or at the money, it doesn't really matter. The same number of contracts, the same number of contracts, even though 
we all know from a risk perspective, one is very different than the other. You know, a, a one cent put versus, you know, a $30 put versus a $15 at the money put. There's very different risks involved in those. And yet a contract is a contract, apparently, from these new uh, new regulatory perspectives, which is also uh, pretty, pretty terrifying uh, when you think of it in those terms. Also, some other interesting stats they were talking about just the universe of listed options out there and how big it is and in some ways unwieldy it has become. And they were talking about uh, CME right now lists about 11,000 underlying, that's all their various futures products out there, corn, metals, et cetera, uh, and 319,000 different calls and puts on those underlyings. Now I'll flip the script to OCC, and they have 4,400 underlying, so fewer uh, than the CME, but nearly a billion <laughs> Calls and puts listed on those various uh, products collectively. Uh, and that gets a little bit confusing when they break it down. If it, does it vary by exchange, et cetera? But if you actually quoted, if some market making firm were to come into the business right now and just quote every product at OCC and every strike, calls and puts, et cetera, on every exchange, so uh, a dozen, soon to be 13 exchanges, it, it surpassed about 13 million total calls and puts that you'd have to quote on a tick by tick basis. Uh, to do that. Obviously, that surpasses the reach of just about anybody out there in the business, but it kind of shows, A, how much the business has grown, and B, is kind of how unwieldy it is. Uh, Mr. Rock Lobster, does this make you miss the days of being a market maker? Would you ever think about diving into this maelstrom again with given all these numbers floating around out there? Um, <laughs> well, I just wouldn't be trading that many stocks. You wouldn't be quoting 13 million series at once? At once? No, I mean, when I left, I was quoting about 150 series. So, Pshaw! I, I laugh know, at you. I know. I know, but I know a lot of like a lot of the guys that quote now are quoting like 500, 500 series. I mean, five hundred names, classes. So, it I, I guess you do. Just uh, that's the way it's it's become such a, a, a technology intensive business. I mean, it's, there was a you could survive probably in two thousand with almost rudimentary technology. Two thousand and one, two thousand and two, but by two thousand and four, that was it. You know, if you didn't have electronic access you were kind of as the exchanges switched over and that was it and now we are all electronic <laughs> so timber hill won <laughs> or, or if you talked to Pedderfee, which we did on our tech show a few months ago they they lost because timber hill is uh is is not making money these days anymore and Pedderfee would probably unwind it if he could uh, speaking of which, actually, a lot of guys on, on the different panels from different market making firms, and they kind of all have agreed, kind of what we said many times here on the show, that if you were going, someone thinking about getting into this business in this day and age is kind of unthinkable. If you're not already a, a legacy market making firm, if you already don't have a handle on some of the costs and the risks and how this stuff works, you know, it's kind of unthinkable for a new firm to jump in and be a liquidity provider now. It's just not a tenable business anymore. And Pedderfee said almost exactly as much. It's not really a viable business anymore uh, when we had him on the show a few months ago, which kind of surprised me because he's one of the pioneers in that space. And they mentioned, of course, you know, some vol funds and others kind of jumping in, but they're really just liquidity takers at this point. And opportunistic liquidity providers, which we all know here, they come in when it suits them, but that's about it. So a very, you know, shall we say, a little bit of a dire a dire outlook there at the industry conference uh, this month, but inter- or this week, I should say. Interesting, interesting stuff nonetheless, though, as a lot of stuff really uh, starts to boil down to you guys on the active retail side. Speaking of boiling down before we jump into the odd block, looks like uh, Disney has indeed reversed itself. That initial, that initial bloom on the rose has faded. It was off about three handles at one point. Now it looks like it's on about a buck thirty-five, trading about a one eleven fifty or so, off from about one thirteen where it was trading. We're closed today, listeners. We'll keep an eye on that intra intra show as we keep on rolling into our next segment. Yes, it's time for the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. everybody welcome to the odd block the funky portion of the show you may want to hide the kids for this portion we get a little bit into the shadier side of the options business here gonna kick things off the name we haven't talked about in a little while this a frequent offender on the old program this is bank of america ticker symbol of course back b-a-c uh up today about 30 cents closing about 17 30 or so nearly two percent on the day. It's the name that does, as you might imagine, a fair amount of paper. It does about 285,000 contracts a day. So one of our lighter volume issues 
out there and just lighting it up today to the tune of nearly 600,000 contracts, over 2x their ADV today. So just lighting it up, about 2.2 to 1 calls over puts out there, again, showing what was excuse me, what was really uh, moving and uh, shaking there in the old back. And what caught our eye this morning was an interesting one from a position perspective, interesting one from a timing perspective, and certainly an interesting one from a size perspective. One of my favorite strategies, the old bullish risk reversal reared its its ugly head out here in Bank of America for, shall we say, some size. I said about nearly 600,000 contracts went up today. Total, about nearly 250 of them going up in this one pretty sizable trade or a decent chunk of those coming up in this. It started off and we started seeing 40,000 of the Nova expiring on the 6th. So going out, going away tomorrow. This is a daily trade, listeners. Uh, weekly 70, 17 half calls going up paper buy-in over the Nov 6, excuse me, Nov, expiring November 6, a weekly 17 puts. So a half a dollar bullish risk reversal going up for six cents and nine cents uh, respectively. So they did it for a three cent credit. Uh, they did it 40,000 times to start. Looks like as the day went on, they did it a total of nearly 100,000 times on the Nov 17 puts and 150,000 times on the Nov 17 half calls. So a wee bit leveraged to uh, the upside there in the, in this risk reversal. So this one's all kinds of funky, Mr. Rock Lobster. It goes out tomorrow, so this is, in effect, a daily binary position at this point. Uh, it's all opening because there's only 12,000 contracts open on the puts and about 30,000 on the calls. And uh, so the size, the strikes... Uh, there's a lot of ways we can play this. The, the time to expiration, where do you want to start? Because it's just it's just crazy town, all sorts of things here in this Bank of America risk reversal. It's kind of like four, four million share knocking. <laughs> like, boom. Yeah, this is you're, serious you're business. Super long, super fast. Uh, I had actually some, our room kind of liked this trade uh, when I wrote it up. So yeah, I think there's... The banks could be making a move, and um, because rates will go up at some point, and banks will actually make money again. So it it, it makes it made some sense. Although you know you really don't have any. It was for a credit. You don't really have any risk till you're below 17. Looks kind of unlikely tomorrow. And if worse comes to worse, you just roll it. Uh, since whatever panic we had in August is gone. Simple as that. You think this guy's going to roll it if, he, if it goes out tomorrow. He's, he's going to wow. That would be this guy likes his broker. Uh, yeah, he might. <laughs> I mean, it's it's one of those things where they might want the stock at seventeen. So, so they're trying for it, or they want a a shooter into tomorrow if you know if it if they knock it up fifty cents or something like that. So, I I would not be surprised um, if the guy makes money on this one. This guy has been on, oh, this, this name has been on a bit of a tear, uh, going into earnings in the 15 handle, now trading about 17.30, like I said, listening. So a bit of an upside run here for BAC of late. And if our friend is to be believed, then perhaps a little bit more very, very near-term upside here in store for BAC. Either that or, like Andrew said, he wants some, he wants some back at the 17 handle, and he's putting his money where his mouth is. Either way, we shall find out tomorrow. That's kind of this kind of put this kind of trades, Mr. Rock. Let's kind of put the lie to the debate that's been going on out there for a while. When we're going to have daily options? When we're going to have daily options? We effectively have those now. I mean, how many times have you and I, just on this show, profiled what are effectively daily trades going up? So the weeklies have provided that. We essentially have daily liquidity now. Kind of a crazy trend, isn't it? It is, and that's what's that's the flexibility of the weeklies. It's pretty cool. I mean, you have ex, you have expiration every week, so. I mean, the exchanges have that already, and I think that's what has attracted a lot of growth and probably why the VIX options, the new weeklies are going to, you know, I think that's just going to be a growing product. It's just going to be too tempting, especially with uh, some of when VIX starts to really get sold off hard. Some of those easy bounces or I wouldn't say easy bounces, but, you know, when it does bounce short term, how uh, interesting that stuff is going to be. So, yeah, I think it's. You, you kind of got, you're starting to get some, I'm not going to call them binary trades, but you're st certainly starting to get daily type of activity. But the thing with uh, options like this is at least you can still create a little space for the daily activity. You know, you got a half a point move in bank, you can still create 
you know, five, $10 moves inside, uh, to make things interesting. So, but it's, it's still like, you know, it's a, it's a real trade. <laughs> <laughs> it's a re- it's legit. When it's, a, when it's nearly a quarter of a million contracts, I don't care where it's going up. It's legit. So we'll keep an eye on this one, listeners. Yeah, and this if you've been asking for a while, we're going to get daily options. We've effectively got them, and they're going up for size here in the old in the old odd block today. And moving on to another name we haven't talked about in a little while. This is shifting gears from the banks to the realm, realm of it. exciting things like insurance. We have MetLife, ticker symbol MET, M-E-T, going out today. $49.90 off, a little over 1% on the day, so not feeling the love out there on the street today, but they were feeling the love from an options perspective. This is the name that does about 11,000 contracts a day, doing a whopping 32000 today. And what started off the frenzy out there we caught this morning were the Nova 50s going up paper, buying for $0.73, cents, 2,500 times as the debt went up in one block over there on the SIBO. As the day went on, the volume continued to the total of just a hair under 15,000 contracts total of these no 50s going up with pretty much uh, paper buy-in uh, starting actually at 66 cents all the way up to that latter kind of 73 cents. Didn't see any stock going up with this one, so it appears to be as it looks on the surface straight up some, some call love here right at the money call love here in good old Met only about 4,700 contracts open here on this strike. So uh, not not a closing trade here. And they had earnings earlier this week, actually, on the 4th. So this is not an earnings play. This is a post-earnings play. And our friend here deciding whatever was up there in good old Met, perhaps he was a fan of it. Also of note, Mr. Rock Lobster, I'm not sure if he caught these, but looks like maybe later out, maybe out of sequence of 6,000 of these Nov 53 half puts went up towards, looks like they went up maybe towards the end of the day. So probably not related, but they could be, uh, given the fact that there weren't many other size trades going up except for those calls today. It does seem like a bit of an odd duck to have these relatively deep at about nearly four handle in the money puts uh, going up at the same time. We got nearly 15,000 no 50 calls going up. Uh, so some intriguing stuff nonetheless. What's your take here? Not dailies, but still pretty near term paper going up here in good old Met- MetLife, Mr. Rock Lobster. It, it- looks like just takeover paper somebody's blasting out in the money puts and buying the no 50 calls it just it's insanely bullish it does scream upside does it not <laughs> and the thing is is if they sold stock against it why sell stock against the 53 and a half puts that's kind of a goof that's not a good trade so, you're not you're not getting you're not getting good <laughs> left good good anything on that if you're doing stock against it not, not much so i you know, if I wake up tomorrow and, and MetLife is 55, I'm not going to be usually surprised. That's all I can say about that one. It just looks wildly bullish. Wildly bullish. Probably the only way you can really describe it. Yeah, you don't see size in the money puts going up like that. That alone is worthy of interest. And then on top of it, of course, just the never-ending love for the Nov 50s, uh, the combo a uh, little bit of a of a deep risk reversal, perhaps. <laughs> Either way, uh, intriguing stuff in the land of you don't think insurance being the place for rocking and rolling unless like you said perhaps a corporate action in the near future for this one you want to keep an eye on MetLife listeners in case our friend out there is indeed uh, on the right track we're going to write thing excuse me we're going to wrap things up with uh, another one this actually i believe a newcomer to the old odd block this is straight path communications ticker symbol strp Closing today, $12.81. Not the best day for STRP, to put it mildly. They're off more than they're worth. They were off nearly $14. uh, So they pretty much got cut in half today. So not the best day for good old STRP. This is the name that does 1,500 contracts on a normal day, doing 35,000 today. So where to begin with this one, listeners? There was paper Pretty much across the board, you picked a strike. It was kind of lighting it up. Uh, we started paying attention on the D20 puts. Uh, these were going up, and we started watching them only 300 some odd times. The one block, uh, this value, this stuff, just kind of lighting it up as the day went on. A total of about a thousand going up on this strike throughout the course of the day. But that's pretty much the course for all those puts. 17 half puts going up in D's nearly a thousand times. 15 puts going up about a thousand times. Nearly 9,000 of the Nov 15 puts. Uh, going up up here, as well as the Nov 5 puts 
here. You're getting a bit of a, a bit of a trend here, listeners. The thing's selling off. Obviously, uh, the puts lighten it up. Also, it sounds like some short sellers uh, were uh, were coming in early, really feeding this uh, this this downside frenzy here in uh, in this name. We also saw some large put spreads. That was indeed why the fives were lighting it up. It was a no five. 15 put spread going up uh, for $3.45. Paper selling that one, perhaps not surprisingly, out there. Uh, this is a crazy one. If you're not familiar with this name, this is, uh, this is Straight Path Communications, Inc. Uh, they do a lot of licensing in the wireless spectrum. And they also have a lot of patent right issues going on. And it sounds like that one took a bit of a turn for the worse out there for them today. Mr. Rockloster, bring us home on this a frenzy of downside paper here in STRP. The funny thing was, is this was this early put seller. I, I thought they were trying to scoop the bottom or something because they're all got run over. This is uh, one of, uh, one of the uh, short selling, you know, investment research firms basically saying this company's all worthless and not worth anything. <laughs> Just took it down 50%. That's crazy. That is crazy, sir. So what I thought um, was <coughs> was very funny was the put sell. They started selling the D twenty puts at less than the four dollars, and now they're nine. The midpoint is like nine bucks. The volatility went up a hundred and two points in this thing. Um, you could sell the two and a half puts if you wanted. You could sell the five puts for fifty cents. So somebody just got ugly all over this stock. And that's um, <laughs> where there's no, but it's only saying they like might be a fraud. It's one thing if like they are a fraud, but it's just amazing what they're doing to these names, just destroying them. Yeah, you could see how that no five foot 15 put spread could be an attractive <laughs> at, uh, at those levels. But given the sell off we've seen in this name, uh, yeah, that one could easily uh, come back. I'm looking at where it's uh, where it's lining up right now. It's a, it's three dollars and ninety cent bid right now. That's at the end of the day here, listeners. So that three forty five sale, not looking too great <laughs> out here. And I'm sure it got a lot an uglier uh, intraday. But still, yeah, a lot of weird stuff afoot for this one. Hey, that's why we call it the odd block, listeners. We like to bring up the odd ones for you, whether it's a pretty sizable, pretty pretty near term risk reversal, or perhaps just some crazy bullish love. In the, in the insurance side of the business, or perhaps you are interested in this frenzied sell-off, crazy, crazy sell-off here in the wireless spectrum licensing rate. Wherever you're looking, wherever you're interested, we got you covered here in the old odd block. Let us know your thoughts, your questions, your comments about that type of activity. Meanwhile, speaking of your questions, your comments, it's that time of the week. It's time to dive right on into the mail block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for The Mail Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Mail Block. This is indeed the portion of the program where we break down your questions, your comments, a lot of ways for you guys to send us those. Of course, I mentioned at the top of the show. We, of course, you can reach us via the mobile app. It's all baked in there. Just hit us up on Twitter. We're just at Options on Twitter, the Options Insider on Facebook, Options Insider on Stock Twits, or via email, questions at theoptionsinsider.com, or, of course, via the website, our comment form, our feedback form, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all right, going to kick things off with a question from, actually, we'll start here, Uncle Mike, because you got a question directly. I don't know why we're on the show, we're your direct email outlet, but apparently we are. Uh, this one comes from Kevin. Uh, he, he says, how do you put on such a small trade for a client and still get paid? Well, I imagine that's a question probably a lot of our, uh, of our, of our listeners, right? And he's actually referring to that. I believe that newlywed client you were talking about in the last episode, uncle Mike, where you're doing some small trades for this, for a kid who was just getting married and getting started off and doing some small stuff. And I think, I'm sure a lot of our listeners are probably surprised that you would take that amount of time for such a small account. Uh, but that's kind of kind of your business over there. So why don't you go ahead and, and, and give our listeners some insight into what you're up to over there with, with these small accounts and how maybe they can get in on the action themselves. All right. So with that, let, let's go through a couple of things. At RCM, we, I, ch I charge between 1% and 2% typically for uh, managing assets in one way, shape, or form. So this is a $500 account. 
And I'm not going to disclose the amount with which I charge on that account, but let's just say I charge 2%, a, a huge amount, of the highest rate with which we have, uh, 2% on that account. So doing the math on that, that comes out to well, about $10 a year if the account stays at the exact same level. Is that come out? Is that the same math that you get, Mark? Sounds good to me, sir. Okay, got it, got it. Now, let's say that my goal, and let's assume that RCM gets absolutely no cut of my business, which is very far from the truth because they do get their portion. And let's say that I have no fees, no costs, no nothing. And I just get to keep all my revenue. And let's say that I wanted to make $30,000 a year. Now I do make a little bit more than $30,000 a year, but let's say that I wanted to make $30,000 a year on that scenario with that client. So let's divide that by 10. I would have to have 3000 clients in order to make $30,000 a year if that were the case. Now, with that, I do make more than $30,000 a year. I will disclose that to the national public, uh, but I have probably about 60 clients. So doing the math on it, if I were to build a business on exactly that situation, number one, there'd be no possible way that I could have time for 3,000 clients. Uh, and number two, there's no possible way with which I could it just couldn't be done. So that's a very valid question. Now, let's go through why I did this and who I did it for and the reason with which I'm really excited about doing it. First things first, this is actually the son of a client uh, that has a larger amount of money. So I, the larger client who is 50, uh, the, the husband and wife are 50, and their son's about to get married, and they basically told their son to come talk to me. Uh, so that's how I hooked up with this specific client. Uh, now, with that being said, do I mind doing that as a favor for my bigger clients that are that are 50? Not at all. I'm happy to do it any time. They've been very good to me through the years. Uh, it's a very long relationship, uh, and I'm happy to do that uh, for someone who, not to sound too much like the Sopranos, but for someone who is in the family, so to speak. Now, with that, I'll tell you the second reason why I wanted to help this kid. Um, this kid is what represents what's everything great about America, so to speak. All right, get ready to start start humming. All right, guys, I'm going to need you to hum in a minute, I think, with what I'm about to say. Uh, this kid, let's think about this. He saved up all of his money through the years, and he saved up about $5,000 through basically doing odd jobs throughout his life and just doing little things here and there. So he wants to do things right. He saved his money. He's not out pounding beers at the bar every Friday night or every night for that matter in college. He's trying to save his money and do the right thing. He's in love with his high school sweetheart. Okay, if you're really in love, then buy her a ring. He bought her a ring. He married her. So with that, you got to really give this kid credit for someone who wants to lay it on the line. So people like that are people that I want to help. And I would say that of the 55, 60 clients with which I have, I would say that probably, you know, I'll be honest, I can't think of any of them who really don't have that type of demeanor to them, who aren't dedicated to what they do in their profession, aren't dedicated to wanting to learn more, aren't dedicated to wanting to save for retirement. I have a very dedicated group of clientele and I'm very proud of them. Now with this kid, Let's say that, okay, I'm making $10 a year on him at best, let's say. And let's say I double his money even. I double his money. Ooh, I'm making $20 a year on him. And with that $20, well, you know, it really isn't going to go too far in terms of the mortgage with which I have to pay. And it's, it's not going to work. But let's take this to the next level. This kid's a junior in college. And he's already had that much ambition in his life to do very responsible things for a 20-year-old kid. He just turned 21. Uh, so he went on his honeymoon before he was even 21, which is kind of funny. He couldn't even have a legal drink on his honeymoon. Uh, but with that being said, a kid like this is going to do big things in his life. It's my strong opinion with that. He's a kid that wants to try his hardest. He wants to do great things. And people like that, that give it everything that they have, that when the chips are down, they do the right things. People like that tend to be successful. Now, people who are successful typically tend to make more money. Now, I don't know what kind of money he's going to make in his life, but based upon how responsible he has been so far, 
I think he's going to make a lot of money throughout his career, and he's going to need a financial advisor throughout his career. And I'm not expecting to make a lot of money off of this client over the course of the next couple of years. He's a young kid starting out in his marriage. But over time, he's going to be a phenomenal client for me if I do the right things for him now, which I am doing to the best of my ability. So to answer your question in terms of how I get paid, I'm getting paid next to nothing for this specific client, and I'm very happy to do this. And I have an open invitation to anyone out there. If you feel that you're like this client, you want to help, you want to take things to the next level. When I say that at the end of the show, that if you just have a few hundred bucks a month, if you can invest, contact me. I'll give my contact information because I love working with people like that. The reason that you stay around in this business is because you do the right things for people. And that's reflected even in this show. Uh, look at Mark Longo. He does the right things for his listeners. If you look at, you just, look, just look at uh, whenever, the, whenever Cisco is brought up. I made a bad trade on Cisco, gosh, I think four years ago. He still gives me crap about it to this day because he wants you, the listeners, to know that I don't always talk about my winners. I'm going to talk about my losers. And if I don't talk about my losers, he's going to talk about them for me. Andrew and Mark, they're legitimate. They've traded on the floor for many years. They've actually built their business. They've walked the walk. And I'm willing to bet, although I don't know their customer service records, I am willing to bet that their customer satisfaction rate is in the high 90th percentile. I don't think there's any way you can ever please everybody. So I'm sure there's one person in the world that doesn't like them. I'm sure maybe one, maybe even two, but probably not more than that. And I say that with all sincerity. These guys walk the walk. This show walks the walk. We've made it close to 500 episodes because of the fact that we do the right thing for people. That's what we stand for. And that's what we're going to continue to do. And that's why I helped that client. And that's how I got paid. And I am very proud of it. Wow, that, that was that's quite, I'm not sure where to begin there, sir. That's a lot there. By the way, I will, for the record, Cisco is coming up with earnings. I did not mention them purposely this time to avoid uh, the horrible pain that I know it inflicts upon you. But you oh, did it You gosh, did it to yourself you this time. To so you did it to yourself this time. I can take no umbrage on that, sir. Oh. <laughs> uh, should I start humming now? Is this the point where I hum? I think we're good, actually. Oh, we're good? <laughs> All right, yeah. Let's, uh, let's, uh, that's impressive. Let's see. I think we got time for one more here on the mail block. Listen, you can't blame me. I don't get to your questions this time. It was Uncle Mike's fault uh, this week. We got time for one more. This one comes in from uh, David. Mr. Rock Lobster, you like this one. This kind of gets near and dear to our heart there on the old odd block. He writes in and says, hey, there is huge open interest for Twitter at the 30 strike for the November monthly. Almost a quarter of a million contracts evenly split, calls versus puts. Uh, can you talk about the possible implications? Is it interesting? Uh, well, David, the last I can tell you, yes, it is interesting. We love all this kind of stuff when you guys write into us and, and point out interesting trades. And, and the possible implications, why Uncle Mike was, uh, was, was, was going on quite a bit on the detail, which we love here on the old program. I always had a chance to, to dig into what's actually been afoot over there in the land of Twitter. It looks like a lot of that volume went up. Back on October 16th with paper coming in. And the stock was about $31, by the way. It's about $28.60 right now. Uh, listeners, a lot of that volume went up back on October 16th. Looks like it was part of a roll. So uh, they closed out on the October 30 strike where they had size open calls and puts. Uh, closed them out for, I think, a penny on the puts. I don't see the exact price it was on the calls. Uh, and then came in, turned around, bought the no of 30 puts for about a buck 85, a buck 90. And the calls for prices around 315, totaling a little over five bucks on that straddle. Uh, this is an interesting one for a couple of reasons, uh, Mr. Rock Lobster. First off, the size, pretty decent size for. Twitter, that's a name that averages only 130,000 contracts a day. So this this one trade accounting for a good chunk of that ADV in one big trade. And then uh, B, we don't see size straddles going up too often out here in uh, in the equity options realm or even a lot of different products. I mean, how long have we been doing the odd block? How many times have we profiled size straddles going up? I haven't had a chance to dig too much deeper beyond those on the date to see if stock or anything else went up or there were any other positions. But it seems like at least our friend here is getting along some premium and he's been doing it for at least a month out here. I'm not sure if you had a chance to look at this one as well, Mr. Rock Lobster, uh, but intriguing from a size and from a volume perspective. And if he is indeed just straight up buying straddles, uh, he hasn't had he hasn't had a chance to really uh, do too well on them. I have, like I said, I haven't dug into the stocks. Maybe his gamma hedges have been off the hook and he's been rolling in cash. But on the straight up option side, doesn't seem like he's getting the pure bang for his buck. He'd be wanting if he was indeed just loading up 
in uh, on Straddle Town again from the 16th till now. The names had really not that much of a range, just gotten up to about the 31, 30, 31 or so handle on the upside, and then down to about where it is now on the downside. So not exactly enough moving and shaking for a five dollar straddle. Uh, but again, haven't dug into the stock too much either. So, Mr. Rocklops, what's your take on on our friend here lo- owning all the Twitter here <laughs> on the on the thirty strike? I, I, it could be, could it be a reversal conversion roll, like some kind of roll like that? I thought about that. I, it looks like he was buying the calls though, too. Like I said, I have to pull up the calls again as well to make sure because that was my first blush. But I thought it right. was just, he was just doing the old reversal conversion. Uh, but if you have, if you can see, some of the prints are kind of coming up weird on this on this platform here. If you can see the prints on the call side and know, maybe we can see for certain uh, if he was indeed. Looks like by, obviously the the paper went up on the sixteenth because that's where the open interest goes off the charts. <laughs> right so, technically and and uh, uh but what's your take on you, th- you think this is a reversal conversion I, I think it is just because they would have sold the straddle prior to earnings you know and it certainly they could have and i think they're up money if they sold this just a flat out straddle right and they certainly could have sold it uh but yeah i see so much you know normally when it's like a hundred thousand contracts something like that it's almost always some sort of reversal conversion combination uh, why are they trading them? I have no clue. I did, you know. That could. I mean, yeah. I'm looking here. It looks like they bought the calls. They were like 305 at 320. They paid 315 for 50,000, and then 315 again when they're 310, 320 for another 50,000. Um, and then they it looks like they definitely bought the puts. So it looks like it may be a straight up straddle. Okay. Uh, you know what? You'd have to look at the print if there's a stock print. Exactly. Or, exactly. They have stock and they're just rolling. I've. As we're showing you, listeners, there's a lot more to this than than appears on the surface than we can right. do. We can but do in two minutes on the show. Generally, if it's a straddle, it tends, you know, volume tends to gravitate toward the straddle. There's been a lot of, you know, over takeover spec. They could have sold that, as I recall, that mid October was sort of the last wave of takeover mania in Twitter when it was kind of making that run. So it could it could be just a straight up premium seller, but generally stuff tends to gravitate toward the strike. That's about the only the big generalization. Um, you know, if they were just it was just kind of a the buyout. I think it's a perennial takeover candidate. Um, it would, it'll probably never be taken over, which will be funny. Like, oh, it's a takeover candidate. But the problem is, is almost everybody that would take them out is kind of a competitor. You know, maybe except for Disney or something like that. But, um, yeah, maybe Facebook will add them to the growing empire. Uh, possibly, but they have I am. Um, meh, I. You think you think they might, but who knows? I think Facebook looks down their nose at the Twitter executive team for some reason. But um, <laughs> there was I heard what, some characterization of what of the executive team, even though they're all probably fabulously wealthy guys driving a clown. A cl- it's a bunch of clowns in a car that drove into a gold mine, <laughs> which is a little uh, derisive, even though they're all probably billionaires. Kind of on the nose, kind of where you're at when the CEO leaves and then kind of has to come back after a long search and they get the same guy. Uh, you know, a lot, a lot of weird stuff afoot there in Twitter. It definitely feels like there's a little bit of, you know, musical chairs at the top. Um, yeah, this is a little good glimpse into how the sausage is made, listeners, how we actually do uh, the odd block here. We usually have a little bit more time than when it's kind of just dumped in our laps, but we like those too. And I mean, my first blush was kind of with Andrew. It looks like when you see these kind of size on one strike, usually it's some sort of reversal conversion. Essentially, they're swapping stock month to month, essentially. But it looks like here this actually may be a straight up uh, premium buy, in which case that's even more interesting because we see those very rarely. And the str- we have to look at, you have to, you want to do your own homework, listeners, you can go look at the stock prints that went up around this time and any sizable stock prints went up near then because then of course when you're long premium the size money is going to be made and the defense is played with the gamma scalps and we haven't gone through the litany of their gamma scalps to see exactly how they perform but on the blush it doesn't look like this one uh, was a, a knockout uh, home run again they got some time before these go away these aren't dailies but still uh, interesting stuff definitely great stuff we love when you guys put out these interesting ones we don't get a chance obviously on the odd block to talk about everything that's interesting but once in a while we find some other ones that you guys are interested in too and we love to talk about those this was actually sent into our oddity show unfortunately that show is on a bit of a hiatus now while we're reworking it so we wanted to talk about it here because we do a lot of options unusual activity on the old odd block as well and we love to talk about it whenever you guys are intrigued by it and unfortunately that's all the time we have for you guys on the show this week but we'll get to you more next week don't worry meanwhile it's time for us to keep on rolling into our final segment it's time for around the block It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for 
Around the Block. All right, Around the Block. Listeners, the portion of the show where we tell you what we're watching for the rest of this week. Good old Diz uh, still bouncing around here in the after hours. Here's our final update. Looks like it's centered around about 112 half now, so off the initial bounce to the downside. Still south of the initial rally here, off only about 30 cents. So, again, that nearly uh, nearly four-plus handle move they were pricing into the stock. Uh, unless you were hedging after hours in the underlying, looks like you're not going to be able to capture that in the in the markets tomorrow, but we'll see where it opens. Meanwhile, of course, we, we prefaced it at the top of the show. There still are some earnings this week, but nothing really big. Humana, pretty much one of the larger ones reporting tomorrow. The big one, really, of course, the old non-farms. We kind of remarked at the top of the show how interesting it is that they're taking all that premium out of the options when there's still a big report to come out tomorrow. And we had, in previous years, kind of written off non-farms. as kind of like uh, an old-school event, didn't really move the markets. And then it came around to surprise us a few times this year and did move the markets pretty aggressively. So uh, we'll see how non-farms plays out tomorrow. Uh, we'll start with you, Uncle Mike. I'm guessing non-farms, the countdown continues 16 hours and a few minutes uh, and counting. Yeah, it's always exciting. It's 7.30 in the morning. I like to tune in and see what's going on with the non-farm payrolls. And uh, you're right, in recent years, it has kind of become a little bit of a snoozer, but in recent months, it kind of has become a little bit more interesting. So that's exciting, but like we talked about, bad news might be good news, which might be bad news, but we'll see if we hit whatever the sweet spot may be. And of course, because Uncle Mike's on the show, Cisco on the 12th, sir. You brought, oh, you brought it upon yourself. <laughs> hey, I need it. Yeah, all right. And Mr. Rock Lobster, non-farms, earnings. What's catching your eye the rest of this week into the weekend, sir? Uh, again, same thing. <laughs> the payroll number and see if volatility, if if this kind of this longer-term vol is, is accurate in as much as um, we start to see things quiet down a little more uh, to get to whatever the next uh, next level of vol is on the downside. So we haven't been able to keep it there. As Mark's been saying lately, 15 is the new 12, and and let's see if we can break out of that on the downside, kind of get back to the sort of longer term uh, ball trends. Get out of this this crazy realm we're in now into some more reasonable numbers, perhaps we shall. We'll see tomorrow, of course, listeners, as the numbers come out. But unfortunately, we'll have to wait and leave it there because that's all the time we have. All right, listeners, that's going to do it for this episode of the old option block. But before we go. As always, let me check back in with my cohorts here, my partners in crime on the old all-star panel. Mr. Rock Lobster, we'll start with you. You guys have some volatility webinars, some other cool stuff cooking over there. What's coming down the pike in the land of the pit? We have our volatility webinar for all the people who want to look at market volatility, like how a pro looks at it. Actually, when it you know when volatility is giving you information, you want to certainly take it to heart uh, and at least not... Uh, if you don't want to fight it, at least position uh, yourself for what at least what the market's pricing, at least understanding what the market's pricing. So that's what our webinar will be tomorrow on uh, Saturday morning, starts at 9.30 Eastern time. Mark and I will be giving it. And it is a don't miss. If you don't like what we tell you, we'll refund your money. How can you lose? They'll give you back all the ace and all the 10 lots you want, listeners, even ones you haven't traded yet. They'll just give them to you. So call up Option Pit. And they'll take care of you over there. And, of course, now we turn our gaze one last time to that sleepy hamlet of St. Charles, Uncle Mike. While you're watching non-farms, what else is cooking in the land of RCM Wealth Advisors? Well, as I am watching non-farms, I am more than happy to answer any phone calls or emails with which have been given to me. Uh, should you decide that you would like to work with Uncle Mike Tusa as a financial advisor, the end of the year is coming. Plans need to be made for the following year. Contact me, folks. Would love to chat with you. Typically, uh, it comes in waves. A lot of people contact me at once, and then no one contacts me for a little bit. But uh, the wave is starting, so contact me soon. Six th I'm sorry, 312-212-3531, or send me an email at mtosaw at rcmfs.com. All right, listeners, on behalf of Uncle Mike and the Rock Lobster and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading and streaming and subscribing to the show, and of course, for sending in such great questions. We'll hopefully get to more of them next week, and we'll see you next time right here on The Option Block.
preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. 